I'm going to get started uh, to respect everybody's time. It's 7.02. So first of all, welcome. My name is Amanda. Um, I am just loving looking through this participant list. Um, this series was kind of developed geared towards the Westminster Choir at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis but we wanted to share it uh, broadly. And um, it turns out that there are just many people from some, some from like random parts of my life and others who I've never met, friends of friends or friends of friends of friends. So uh, thanks for being here. It's very cool uh, to see such a, a wide ranging group. Um, we are recording today's session. And so that'll give us a chance to be able to go back to it later. Um, and I think that uh, we can probably also um, pass around the PowerPoint slide uh, with Yolanda's permission um, after the fact if people want to revisit that as well. Um, and I uh, just want to request that you stay muted unless, um, unless you're invited to share something. Uh, and also at the bottom of your screen, if you haven't used it before, there is a chat button uh, and that enables you to chat, to send a message to the whole group or to a specific person privately. And that can be a good way during these sessions to, um, to ask a question or to give some feedback or something that you're thinking of without um, kind of interrupting the flow. Uh, so I want to say welcome, especially to our guest speaker this evening, the Ooh. Reverend Dr. Yolanda Williams. Uh, every time I uh, connect with her, she's got another title on her name. It's amazing. Um, I most recently had a fabulous experience uh, working closely with Yolanda through my work at the Shakopee Prison with Voices of Hope. Um, in the fall and uh, she's coming to us today with a wealth of knowledge both as an educator uh, as a professional musician herself and most recently as a pastor um, and so i'm excited to uh, hand it over to you yolanda if you want to um, give a further introduction to yourself and to the series and we'll jump right in great thank you so much amanda um, I want to make sure that everybody knows where that chat bu button is because sometimes you have a question but you don't feel like you can butt in. I, I don't mind people asking questions. I don't consider that butt in. I consider that interactive learning. So if you want to ask a question, go right ahead and ask a question. If you don't want to interrupt but you want to ask a question, go ahead and use the chat function and make sure it's set to everyone so that we can all see it. And if I miss it, someone else can clue me in that there is a question there. So to start off, I think I want to just ask people to quickly uh, introduce yourself. Um, you can introduce yourself by name or how you come to this, this work uh, as, or as a choral member, as a director, as just an avid uh, supporter of the arts. And then the second thing I'd like you to do is to think a moment and answer the question, what does it mean to hear soul? So this hearing soul is our title. And I will certainly tell you what I was thinking when that title came to mind, but I'd like you all to have an opportunity to introduce yourself and to explain or give a definition for everyone of what you mean or what do you think it means to hear soul? Is there somebody who'd like to go first? This is Phil Asgian. and I'll go first. Okay. Uh, I'm, a member, I'm a member of the Westminster Choir and okay. hearing soul to me means music from the heart. Great, wonderful. Anyone else? I'm Mary Ann. I'm not, I'm a member of Westminster. I used to sing in a community choir. I don't have a voice for it anymore. But uh, gospel, soul, all of that tradition of music. I grew up in Missouri. It's what speaks to me. It's what speaks to me in ways that nothing else does. Okay, great. I'm Karen Ruffalo. Hi, I'm, I'm one of the members of the choir. And I actually think of soul as being actually more than just the heart, 
but with the whole body. Wonderful. And then Kathy, I think you were still there. Hi, Yolanda. Yeah, I'm Kathy Fisher, and I am a member of Westminster, but I've been in music all my life and um, was just really eager that this series was going to happen, and thank you for being here. Um, when I think of soul, I, Karen, I think your description of that would echo mine. It's a whole body experience. Thank you for putting words to it. Um, when I think of soul music, I think of Marvin Gaye. I think of so many of the um, prominent uh, black musicians and the rich heritage that they've shared with us. Thank you. Great, thank you. How about a couple more? Okay, I'll go. Hi, I'm Gen Z Silverman, and I'm delighted to see Marianne here. She actually is taking a class right now that I am teaching about um, music of the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement. So um, I'm a music educator. Um, I've done some choral singing, but not a choral member, but I happened to see on um, a mutual friend of Amanda's and mine and uh, one of Westminster's former choral directors, Tesfa Wanda Magniu, I noticed um, he was tagged in um, Amanda's Facebook post about this series of presentations, and I absolutely love African and African American choral music. And um, since I occasionally include some of this music in classes I teach, I thought, okay, I'm all about this. I got to be there. Um, what does music with soul mean? I would kind of incorporate what a lot of you have said, music that moves the performer and the listeners, body, mind, and spirit, and makes you feel connected to something greater than yourself. Great, wonderful. And then Haruka, I see that you're here. So why don't um, you go next? Yeah, I'm Haruka. I am here because uh, I am uh, I interned with Amanda's prison choir, and I'm also a future music educator um, going into my fifth year. Um, and I think that hearing soul is when you can hear that someone has put 100% of themselves into the music that they're singing or performing. Great. Great, wonderful. So I'm sorry we don't have time to go through everybody, but if you would like to continue posting uh, your introductions, you can use the chat function for that because I wanna make sure that we can get through this information because as per usual, I always have more information um, that I have time to share. So if I skip a slide, you'll just have to forgive me. Uh, you'll have the slides that you can look at later. So hearing soul is really all those things. And the reason that I wanted that to be in part of the title is because when we engage the so-called other's art, we enter into a unique perspective, a unique opportunity to get to know people um, in, in ways that words might not offer that. Or if we're in our own cultural setting or their own cultural setting, there might be some things that are gonna prevent us from getting to know one another. And I often say in my classes that if you wanna know a people, you go to their arts and you go to their food. Because those two things will tell you more about what they value, what they're afraid of, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what makes them angry, then I think often any of the research papers a person could uh, read. And so I wanted to really make sure that we have two things. One, that we're open to someone else's soul being presented. And more importantly, you hear it. You're not going to judge it. You're not going to compare it. You're not going to put it into your own perspective. You're just going to hear it. And I think once you've heard another person, then there's always room for you to go back and to put it into your own perspective or to uh, measure it up with what you understand and what you believe. But the first act, and particularly in these days, 
of, of COVID, not only COVID, but um, finally looking at the massive number of deaths uh, that have happened to African Americans at the hands of police officers. The thing that has been missing all along was people actually hearing the soul of the other. And so all of that, pour all of that stuff bearing down on a little lecture is way too much. But that was my thinking, that we need to learn how to hear each other and hear each other's souls. So. I want to make sure that we talk about the fact that definitely music, um, along with all the other arts, I don't want to leave them out, speak of culture. And I'm often in my lectures going to talk about vocabulary so that we all have exactly the same vocabulary. A lot of times when I hear people use the word culture, they're referring to one thing, ethnicity or skin tone. And I want you to get the impression that culture means a much larger, takes into a much larger consideration of elements. It's values, it's rules, it's customs, it's language, it's the social institutions that manage those values, those rules and those customs and that language. And then, as I said before, I also want us to really consider ourselves to be active listeners. How can we hear? Because hearing is, for me, the first act towards understanding. So our agenda for these two settings is the first one, I want to kind of do it in intervention of a lot of American education that I have been subjected to and that you've probably been subjected to and some of you may have even participated in. And then I want to give you a working vocabulary of musical items that I'm sure my colleagues are going to go over. They might change some of the words. They might just kind of tweak some of the meanings, but starting at some kind of basis for that. And then the second part, uh, which is next week, I really want to talk about what happens to in the African diaspora that we're going to focus on uh, most, which is for the United States. So the first intervention, and I call them interventions because I think somehow something has to happen to disrupt what we believe and how we have uh, participated in the knowledge of the continent of Africa. First of all, it's not a country, it's a continent. There are 54 recognized countries between 1,500 and 2,000 spoken languages that are recognized. There are a lot of languages that aren't recognized or considered just dialects. There are over 3,000 ethnicities, so not everybody in Africa is dark-skinned. Some of them are red-toned, some of them are yellow-toned. We even have albinos. And every modern religion you can think of, Christianity, Muslim, um, Hindu, as well as many traditional religions are pra practiced over that country or that continent. The second intervention is that there were major empires. And most people think that because of the Tarzan movies and uh, a lot of the movies that have come out even today, like out of Africa, that most people on Africa are just either working for their European owners, coffee plantation owners, um, or they're swinging from trees. And I want you to know that there were major empires with male and female rulers. So it is not just a patriotic society, not just a matriarchal society, but there were rulers back and forth. And that they prized education they had major universities and libraries that taught philosophy and theology and medicine and law. In fact, Christianity owes most of their uh, scholars, most of the scholars uh, of our first and second centuries to their travels to the continent of Africa. Some of those major places, and I'm just gonna buzz through them because I want you to see the scope of this, is the, the kingdom of Kush, which had its heyday in the second millennium. Uh, and also the, some of the emperors of Kush were Egypt's pharaohs 
in their 25th dynasty. So when we think about Egypt as being a separate Middle Eastern place, I it always kind of ticks me off a little bit when I go to a bookstore and I'm looking for something about Egypt and it's not in the Africa section, it's in the Middle Eastern section. It's on the continent of Africa. And even though it shares a lot of history, it had sub-Saharan uh, black rulers uh, in its 25th dynasty. It was cosmopolitan Kushwas, and it was a major trade center as most of these empires, as most of the European empires, because that's how you get to be an empire, right? We have the empire of Punt, uh, which was called the land of the gods. And we know about these things because the Greeks and the Roman wrote about, historians wrote about these places and traveled to these places. So they're not just kind of pie in the sky ideas. They are documented. We also have Aksum, uh, which had its heyday in the third and sixth centuries BCE and extended all the way to Southern Arabia in its empire. We have the Malian Empire, which most um, notable in black music is the name of the city Timbuktu, which was when Sankor uh, University and library was found. And I spring that up because there are a lot of songs from the 1800s and the 1900s that are part of African American uh, folklore as well as popular music that use the term Timbuktu because Timbuktu becomes this place uh, of freedom, a place where no matter where you were from uh, the continent of Africa as an enslaved individual, you recognize that there was a place of freedom called Timbuktu and you can find this term often in early African American music and folklore. And then we of course have the Songhai uh, and you can see just how large um, this, this section is. And we're getting now to more the West African side of things. And West Africa, very important uh, because a lot of the musical elements that we consider part of African American diaspora in the United States has a lot of West African elements. And so they typically focus on West Africa for those elements. Then, of course, Zimbabwe, which is more the Central Africa, and some people think that the Queen of Sheba might have been from this place, but it was a huge mercantile center as well. So I'm not trying to give you the quick and dirty lesson of the continent of Africa, but I want to intervene in this idea that nothing was going on in Africa except for agrarian society, herders. We have those, we certainly have the Berbers, the nomadic people, but we also had major cities and major centers of education. The second intervention that I want to present to you is this idea about Africans in the new world. A lot of times um, it is taught that the first Africans that came to United States in the New World came as enslaved people and that is not true. The first Africans that came to the New World were actually explorers. Uh, we know this because of the writings of Columbus who, who writes in his journals that when he spoke to native peoples, they spoke of dark skinned, woolly haired, people who had come in long boats and had traded with them. We also have found that there are certain names that were part of native people's language that actually have their heritage in Egyptian names. There are also stories about the shipping and navigation prowess of Africans that are in the early writings of those who came afterward. And of course, we have lots of artifacts. We have been finding uh, bronze um, bowheads, uh, spearheads rather, and artifacts that have African facial features. And most of you are probably familiar with the Olmecs, uh, the Olmec Society of, New of Mexico, which has the really large heads, kind of like Easter Island, but that they have specifically African facial features. So Africans come before Columbus, 
as free people and settle in among the natives um, and intermarry. Two of those great African explorers is King Ramses, uh, which the picture is here, and uh, Abi, Abi Bakari, uh, who is also called Manzaku, who was from Mali. And they have traced his work and his, um, his influence in Brazil and what is now called Mexico, and even as far as what is considered now Colorado. So I think this is important. I don't think. I know it's important because when you think about a people as having an only history as being enslaved people, you have placed on them already victimization. And I'm not trying to downplay enslavement, um, but I am saying that there is more to the African contribution to choral music or any music or any culture in the United States than just from the point of being enslaved. So the conclusions that we can draw from the things that I've already said is that if we're gonna talk about African music, we really don't have a whole, uh, uh, we can't really place one thing on African music. If Africa is a continent, then the discussion of one African music is, doesn't make any sense because there's a huge, large variety, whether it's from one of the coasts or in the center or in the north or in the south, uh, if it's from one of the 2,000 different languages. And so when we talk about those elements that have survived in the United States diaspora, uh, we're really trying to narrow it down to the things that we can identify as being, A, different from uh, the European aesthetic, and B, also different from what we know as native music. Mm -hmm. So the African music, that whole eye concept really doesn't exist. The other thing that also is part of this large variety that is also a little bit a part of um, this intervention is that when we talk about African music, most people immediately want to dive into rhythm. They immediately think that the Europeans were the ones who had the wonderful melodic and harmonic elements, the Africans had the rhythmic elements, and somehow they came together in the United States and ba-bam, we've got rock and roll. Well, the thing is that many of the African scholars have been doing a lot of work on the melodic and harmonic elements that are found in their own country's music. And so again, with this intervention, we have to consider that choral singing is not just a European aesthetic, that when Africans sing chorally, it's not because they were colonized by Christians who taught them to sing in choral ways. They were already doing group singing. They weren't doing uh, setting up things as a choir, but communal singing is a part of every tradition and every traditional people does choral singing. They just don't call it necessarily a choir. The other thing that we're gonna notice is that there are some specific performance practices that are traditional to many cultures on the continent of Africa. And some of the traditions that my colleagues will talk about that you should use if you're going to sing spirituals correctly, if you're gonna sing gospel music correctly. There's certain things that are going to make it sound uh, African-American or will also give it um, true respect to the singing style that you're going to want to keep in mind. And also there's some differences about how the song is organized. So let me stop there and see if there's any flurry of questions or comments that we need to deal with before we move on. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, just kind of a quick question well, I guess it's not really a quick question, but um, going back to 
one of your first slides, you know, you said over 3,000 ethnicities. And I think a lot of people, including myself, struggle to define ethnicity because obviously it's different than race and it's encompassing of culture, but what, how would you define th the word ethnicity? Okay, great question. Let me start with race. The term race is an unscientific division of peoples based on facial features that was used to identify higher forms of humans and lower forms of humans. So I myself don't even like using the term race. And so you, most often I will say skin tone or skin color um, because race is the problem. Race does not exist. We're the human race and that's the only race there really is. So ethnicity then comes down to identification. How I identify myself nationally, uh, value setting, the institutions I support, and the languages, right? It's the same difference between sex and gender. Sex is biological, gender is identification. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. I, I just always like to kind of different, I mean, it's not, it's obviously always the same answer, but people put it in different ways, and I always find it really enriching to my own personal growth and understanding, so thank you. Wonderful, you're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, well, we're gonna slide on here so we can listen to some music before we get through here. So the other thing I wanted to mention as part of the conclusion is that we're talking about a huge diaspora. So diaspora basically means the, a dispersion. It's all the places where people have had to go or went. Uh, and diasporas can happen because of uh, like the Irish coming to the United States because of the potatoes, um, the crop failing in the potatoes. It can happen because of war. Diasporas can happen, as we have talked about all the time, because of enslavement. And the African diaspora is enormous because it includes Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Uh, most people only focus on the African diaspora in the United States or in South America, in the Americas, but they forget that the first diaspora was actually to Europe and to Asia. That when we talk about African music, we have to talk about syncretization. So syncretization is just a big word that means when you take things that are disparate, different, and you put them together to create something brand new. So one and two equals three. Um, and syncretization happened because of the Africans coming into contact with native indigenous people, um, Africans coming into contact with Europeans, and Africans coming into contact with other Africans. Because remember, as part of the Middle Passage, um, there were great forts that were set up on the coast to try to meld all these different African ethnicities and languages into one little batch that could be put onto a ship uh, and hopefully helping them, pre preventing them from speaking their own language and from practicing their own practices, you kill off uh, the things that make this people unique and you make them into this blob that can be then bought and sold. Um, fortunately, I think because of the human spirit, wherever the human spirit is, whether it's the Jewish diaspora or the Bulgarian diasporas, people hold on to those things that they truly value and that speak of their unique identity. And maybe it changes, but that thread still runs throughout their lives. The diaspora is also com a complex conversation because we have not just enslaved Africans, but we have free Africans. If you look at some of the first um, census that were done in the United States, you'll notice that there are people who say they are from African. They don't say they're American. And so even at 
that point in the 1800s to 1700s, previous, prior to the Civil War, we have people who are identifying themselves as African, not as part of the United States. So in all of this, you know, I want to bring us back to that first point, which is when you listen for the soul or when you listen to the soul, that you hear the people. And that is the whole point of listening to this through the, the lens of choral music. So I wish it were that easy that we could just hear the soul, but there are things that are going to impact our ability to actually get through to just the soul. And one of those is synchronization because the African-American music is not African, it's not American, it's somewhere in the middle, right? And because the people that were here, whether they were free or enslaved, had to battle with constantly, should we preserve our African heritage or should we assimilate so that we can be successful and be accepted? And that comes out constantly in the type of worship services that you would see in the 17 and 1800s and even probably today um, and the types of denominations that happen and the way pop music is done or the way art music is done. Do we constantly want to preserve any Africanism we can or for the sake of being successful, do we assimilate or do we something in the middle? The big thing that always um, impacts our ability to hear and to learn is money. I'm sure you'll agree with that. And once we start deciding, or once it was decided that the musical uh, aesthetic of the African in this country was something of value and could be bought and sold and packaged, all of a sudden we have yet another influence on what the music is going to sound like or what music is going to be preferred or what music you even get to hear because some of those things it's just like you know today um, some of the best hip-hop music there is is not on the radio it's in the internet it's on the underground uh, radio stations because you don't get to hear all this other stuff because it's commodification. It's about what will sell. And what will sell is not always, in my opinion, the best examples of things. We also have this uh, blurring, at least in, uh, on most of the continent of Africa, of sacred and secular, which is not a European thing. European is very, very hard and fast. What is going to be sacred? What is going to be secular? And if you have a group of people that don't believe in a difference between sacred and secular, you're gonna have some issues. Uh, and we certainly saw this in the blues because the blues, of course, uh, was basically uh, secular music and gospel music was the blues sung with Christian lyrics. And many of the original pastors did not want someone coming in their church on Sunday morning and singing the blues, even if they did throw up Jesus here and there and there. They just didn't want that music in there. So this idea of battling between the two um, is also going to impact our ability to hear just the soul and not be uh, swayed by all the other things. And then, add on top of that, the fact that we want to divide music up. Uh, art music being the music that is composed not to be sold, but as a, a museum piece, as something that is wholly intellectual, uh, that has beauty to it, but that's the whole purpose. I want to create something that is beautiful. Or folk music, which is just the traditional music. This is, uh, as you know from your own European history, um, put down quite a bit as being inappropriate kinds of music because it sometimes made people want to tap their foot. It sometimes made people want to shake their head and we can't have that. And then we get to pop music. We just want to package and sell it. Uh, and because we want to package and sell it, it has to be the style of music that's going to cross all barriers. It has to be middle of the road music that regardless of your age, regardless of your region, 
you can uh, enjoy it and will be uh, someone that's going to support it with your money. So all of these will impact hearing, but I'm hoping that because I've told you to watch out for those, that you will, when it comes up, you'll put it aside and you'll just press on to hearing the soul. So let's get to the vocabulary because I can see I'm running out of time here. So remember I told you that uh, Africa is a continent and there are all these countries and there are all this language and that we can't really just talk about African music. And that's true. But what we can do is say that there's certain aesthetics that run through the earliest music in the United States that was performed or influenced by Africans that had some generalities. And so these are some of those generalities. West, main, mostly West Africans did not believe that there was a possibility for there to be a bad sound. So you'll notice that People on the continent sing with navel, nasal voices, they sing with husky voices, they sing with raspy voices, they sing with piercing voices, and all that sound is acceptable. All that sound is good. It's only when we get to the point of uh, art music getting into the mix that all of a sudden we start saying there's certain types of voices that are preferable and there are certain types of ways to use your voice that are preferable. And I'm using the word preferable, but if you've ever sung in a choir where someone has asked you if you could just sing a little softer, you know that I'm not talking about preferable. It's really that it's a bad sound. So this freedom that a person might have in whatever sound your voice produces is a good sound is why we're able to have such a large variety of the sounds that are in the traditional and i'll keep using the word traditional black chorus you'll notice that black choruses do not sing as if all the sopranos are one voice and all the altos are one voice and all the tenors are one voice and so on and so on. So it's more like it's a garden. It's more like it's a symphonic orchestra. Some of those sopranos sound like flutes. Some of them sound like clarinets. Uh, some of the basses are going to sound like double basses and bassoons. Some of, some of the voices are gonna sound like French horns and all of that is acceptable and all of that is encouraged so that it's more based on no bad sound than there is a specific sound we want everyone to blend in and to replicate. The other um, vocabulary that I want you to keep in mind of an aesthetic from African culture is this idea that everybody participates uh, even though you can see in my next point, there was a professional music cast, uh, people who were born into the family as musicians and took up the job as musicians. They were assigned to courts um, there that was considered their job. There was also this idea that even if the professional is singing or playing or dancing, you're supposed to participate as well. You can hear this not just in music, you can hear this in traditional black worship services. The fact that the pastor is preaching doesn't mean everyone's supposed to sit quietly on their hands. No, you're supposed to say amen, you're supposed to say ouch, you're supposed to say go ahead, you're supposed to say preach. Everyone is supposed to participate. And if you're not participating, then the person who is leading uh, the musical uh, performance or the musical event is not doing their job. And so keep that in mind. We most often hear that as call and response. And I wanna make sure that everybody understands that there's a difference between call and response and echo. In call and response, there is a cyclical conversation between a leader or a group of leaders and everyone else. 
Sometimes the leader says the same thing over and over in a rote fashion and the response is always different, but most often the leader is the improvisation and the response is always the same thing. It's kind of like that commercial uh, where it says, I say Hillshire, you say beef, Hillshire beef. That's call and response. But if I say Hillshire and you say Hillshire, that's not call and response. So when you play what I've just played, that's not call and response, that's echo. And I'm sorry to beat that dead horse, but it's one of those things that has gotten through in music education and I just feel the need to fix it. So if you could help me fix that, that people don't call echoing call and response, I would be grateful. The other thing is that music and singing does not occur in traditional African music in isolation. In fact, in over 700 languages on the continent of Africa, there isn't a separate word for music or for song because it's considered all a part of everything. When there's music, it's also considered speaking, or when there's music, there's also dancing, or when there's singing, there's also drumming, or when there's drumming, there's also dancing. All of that might also have some kind of skit or some kind of prayer that goes along with it. But it doesn't occur in isolation. And we certainly can see that the origins of the African participation in the British colonies included the same kinds of things, um, that music was considered a part of your work. Music was considered a part of your communication. I have a very good friend uh, who is a Ghanaian master drummer. And when we used to team teach a course together, he used to say that in his, in his family, if he had done anything to upset his mother, that he would never come to his mother and say, you know, I'm really sorry. He would sing to her a song about a boy who did something that upset his mother. And it was through the singing that he would give the apology. So even in his family and his immediate family, music is not a separate thing. It's how I'm going to even communicate in my immediate family. So, very important to see then this idea, if we're talking about a soul communicating beyond words, a soul communicating through the entire body, um, the listening, hearing the soul as being something that is going to go beyond uh, just mere performance, is giving of yourself 100%, that this music is the same thing. There's also in our performance considered, um, we use the term timeline. And the timeline is basically a set of instruments that lay out the events of the music. And it is, would be what we would call today in modern music, the loop. It is something that continues. It might have some slight variations but usually hear it with a combination of metallic and um, skin instruments that continue along. They might get louder, but they basically kind of are our drone in some way uh, as the music occurs over top of it. Along with this one line that's happening, we have all the other lines of music that actually start off soft, hit um, an apex, come back down, and then it circles back around because traditional African music is very cyclical. It doesn't do this thing that Western music does where you start at the beginning of the measure and you read to the end of the song and then it's done. But you'll notice this uh, particularly, and I keep bringing up the blues, but blues is one of my favorite genres. You notice this particularly in the blues that the song seems like it goes on forever or the joke about jazz you know jazz can last five minutes or five hours depending on how many solos you have um, because it has what we call a turnaround and this turnaround is something that we can look at as an african aesthetic that has been built into african-american music 
so that this idea of a cyclical conversation again, the cyclical performance continues even on uh, in our African uh, American music. And then lastly, the thing that most of you know already is that improvisation is prioritized. So what do we mean by improvisation? And I say that because a lot of people think, uh, have different opinions about it. Improvisation is creating the music at the same time you're performing. It's different than a jam session, although a jam session can have elements of improvisation. It's not just we're just going to keep playing until something good happens or we're just going to keep free for alling. In improvisation, there are some understand, understood, um, some understood parameters, uh, which might be the key or the speed or uh, what form we're using. The improvisation is how can I take that box and then say my own thing within that box? It is to me the ultimate communication because we all improvise in communication. We look at body language, we look at facial features, we listen to the tone of the voice, and we engage in this give and take uh, based on what we see happening in real time. And that for me is the best idea of understanding what improvisation is. So I'm gonna stop another minute here and see if there's any questions or comments. I had a um, question a bit ago. Uh, a couple of people gave me their opinions, but I'd be curious to hear yours regarding um, syncretization. I was just wondering mm -hmm. if you view that um, concept as having a positive or negative connotation or, or if it's just like a fact, it's just something that happens. Because I feel like I often feel torn between um, feeling like sad that cultures kind of lose their uh you know original music or something on the one hand on the other hand it's like wow what a cool thing that's happened from this mix of a new of two different cultures yep um i think it's both um but i think it's evolution you mm -hmm. know the ways in which we have fortunately not needed tonsils anymore who knows what they were for um but that was a synchronization our body decided at some point we didn't need those anymore and yes, I would love to still hear some of the real traditional musics of people, but I'm more in awe of the creativity of human beings. The fact that no matter what you throw at us, we somehow seem to be able to take that and to make something beautiful out of it. And so I try to think only of the positive. But yeah, I do sometimes mourn the fact that there's music I'll never hear that is gone forever. There are people that we'll never hear from because they've, um, they've died off and we'll never know what they were really like. But that's evolution. So I try to settle myself with that. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, keep on um, chatting if you have some things you want to post. So let me see. Okay, all right, I can get through this. So we talk about the melody that is most often seen as influenced by people from the continent of Africa. We talk about the fact that they have instituted what are called blue notes. Blue notes are pitches that are slightly lowered. And part of the reason that we think this happened is because remember Western, the Western world was going towards the well-tempered piano, right? The clavier, so that the smallest step you can have between two pitches is a half step. But most of you might know this already, that most of the world has steps smaller than half steps. And so their music cannot be played on our piano. Um, they have to be played on string instruments or wind instruments where you can get in between and have those microtones. And so the, the closest that Africans playing in using these American instruments, um, when they moved from just playing the violin uh, to, and the banjo, fretted instruments to they had to 
put that in vocally. And so that vocal is being able to sing pitches that are slightly under, we might call them out of tune, but when you hear them in context, they almost sound as if it's mourning. There's something, there's some lament to that. And this idea of putting pitches together, whether it's the pentatonic scale, a five note scale that has a skip in it. So la, 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 instead of la, 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 having a skip in it, again, gives us a sense of bittersweetness. And I like to think that that's part of the reason why um, the music uh, that is co composed by African Americans to perform by African Americans always has this sense of the happy and the sad, that the things are bittersweet. It's not that we don't have the happy, happy, don't worry, be happy kind of music, but a lot of the music has this kind of tug at your heart and the Europeans tug at your heart by resolutions, the way they, res they, set, up, uh, they set up two notes that, that are fibrous and they are friction and then you resolve. The way the African sets up the bittersweetness is by bending pitches. Hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Harmony. A lot of the harmony that we hear in traditional African music, um, and another way we look at that is texture, the ways in which melodies interact to create harmony is through polyphony. So polyphony, poly always means many or multiple, phony means sound. So multiple primary melodies that interact and when they happen to cross each other, it's at the crossing that we get harmonies. Uh, we think about heterophonic music and I'm gonna play some examples, so hang on. Heterophonic music is when there's one primary melody but because we value improvisation, you are given license to move away from the primary melody as long as you don't move so far away that the primary melody is lost. Any of you who listen to Celtic music? Mm -hmm. A lot of Celtic music is heterophonic, right? A lot of Irish music is heterophonic because everybody's playing basically the same melody, but again, because we value improvisation, you have permission to veer off from the melody and come back, as long as you do not damage the original melody. And there are a lot of parallel harmonies that are done in African music and even African American music. And I remember when I was a music student at the U, um, and we would take theory classes, we'd always be told you can't have parallel this and you can't have parallel that. Um, and that was, of course, then the art music element coming in and impacting what was already going on in the folk world uh, to somehow raise the level of the music. But you will notice those quite a bit. So what I want to play for you, I'm going to skip through this is, let's see, I'm going to go to a different screen because I want to play for you uh, something from the, hang on, let's see if I can do that again, share screen, desktop, whiteboard, right. oh, maybe I closed it. I think I have it on a slide, so we'll do the slide. Um, so I want to play for you, before I play this one, it's a more modern one, I want to go to some of the African singing. So there is a group of people who call themselves the Ba'aka. Uh, they are found in Cameroon and Gabon, and they do a type of yodeling um, that is very polyphonic. And remember, what we're saying about polyphonic is that all of the melodies being performed are considered primary melodies. There isn't a secondary melody. All right, so let's see if this works. Tell me if the music is, if you can hear the music.
can hear in that is the cyclical nature that I was talking about. That there are sounds like there's a primary da di da 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 da, right? You can hear that pretty clearly, but you can hear everyone else just adding. They're not worrying about am I on the third? Am I on the fifth? Am I doing an octave? Am I trying to match? They're just communicating. And it kind of reminds me sometimes of when I have been on the campus of MCTC and I can hear. Uh, people speaking in foreign languages, and everybody appears to me to be speaking at the same time. But for the group that is enjoying that conversation, they can clearly hear what needs to be primary when and what needs to be secondary, and they can just exchange back and forth who is primary at any time. And that's the way I think of the kind of polyphonic singing that we can hear in this. Do we have any comments uh, from people? I see one here. I'm not a fan of Western like Alpine yodeling, but I like this. Anything? It's very soothing, isn't it? Be and it's because of the cyclical nature of it that makes it seem like it can be very soothing. Any other comments? Fascinating yeah, vocal I had one, and that is, I I think that it sounds like I I when I heard this music, I first. Thought, thought of bird song and all the sounds of nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I think, you know, um, people still are going around and round on this, but I, I really firmly believe that the first music really came as uh, an expression of the soul, and the first word we, where we hear it is in replicating the nature that's around them. Uh, I still believe that that's true about rhythm, that uh, for people that can hear the sound of the earth pulsing and they can hear the sound of their heart pulsing, that those were the first tempo sets that we can hear in music that have sped up since with uh, industrial sounds. Let's see, what else do we hear here? Um, just wanted to close my eyes and imagine the group singing. I've been trained for years and who knows how long it would take me to learn to do. I think the whole point, Carrie, is you don't have to learn it. You just do it because there's no bad sound. So you can just do it and you would be accepted. Give it a try um, sometime. <laughs> yep. Good. Good. I hope you will. So let me see. Hello. I want to go back because I'm running out of time here. Sorry, Amanda. There are a couple of other um, musical elements, vocal techniques I want you to be aware of. This one we just heard, which is ululation. Ululation is a vocal sound that doesn't have words. So it'd be hums, screams, cries, moans, and this yodeling, which doesn't have a word attached to it. We also have vocables. Vocables are vocal sounds that use nonsense words or nonsense syllables. So even in Western music, when we say tra-la-la-la-la, that's a vocable. When you say skibbity doo da or some kind of scat, that's a vocable. Portamento is when you slide into a pitch or you slide down to a pitch. We hear a lot of that in African music and certainly in African-American music. We don't really have a good term for this, but I use the term coloratura. It's when people sing um, multiple pitches on one turn, on one uh, a syllable. It's called often melisma, but to me the coloratura is that it is vocal acrobatics that have a lot more to do with just being able to do all the things that the voice can do rather than having to worry about a syllable. We also hear in African music and in African American music, a real range of timbre. So timbre is the color, the quality of sound. You can hear people who will start out singing really husky and then go into a whine sound. Think about people like um, James Brown, for example, or Mahalia Jackson, for that matter where they start out with one color of a vocal sound, and then when the song calls for it, change the color of the sound to match the words. And then the thing that I always find totally amazing is the range. You have people who uh, are in choral groups that can sing anywhere from a high soprano down to a high tenor. 
Uh, you have tenors that can sing alto lines and they're not considered castrati's, but they can sing those alto lines with the best. Think about Philip Bailey of Earth, Wind and Fire, for example. And so as I close here, I wanted to play for you one of my favorite uh, gospel groups uh, because, and I'm not going to play the whole thing because you can listen to it on your own and I want to give you some time for the wrap up. But you'll hear all of the elements I just spoke of in the very beginning of this song. All that I know got something within me oh, 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 oh yes, yes. so oh, 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 something within me within me Lord, within me something within me so hopefully you heard Coloratura, you heard portamento, you heard timbral changes, you heard some ululations in there, you heard the whole package in just the opening of that one song. And that's where we'll stop. Uh, so uh, are there any final questions before we wrap up? Yeah, either out loud or in the chat? Um, I just want to uh, remind people that this was part one of two. Uh, Dr. Willem is, is the only speaker that we have in this series who's going to do th this uh, a second session here. Um, and I asked her about that up front, knowing she would give us a lot of this historical um, kind of background and knowing how hard that might be to fit into one or even two sessions. Um, so I hope that you will all return uh, next week, same time, and bring a friend uh, and keep coming back uh, for the next several weeks as we get to hear from a number of different speakers. I found this so, um, so educational. I took like four pages of notes, so uh, I think others were taking notes too. I could see it. And um, yeah, any, anyone else want to add any uh, words of gratitude or, or questions? I see lots in the chat. Lots of thank yes. you. Thank Wonderful. Okay, so again, this um, session was recorded and uh, I'll send a like a mass email out to all who registered to let you know where those videos end up. Uh, but I do hope you'll share it. And let's all just say a big thank you to Dr. Williams. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you. Looking forward to next week. Thank you.